Welcome to the Tough Decisions Network. This is our special Sunday edition called Survive and Thrive with Danae. Your host, Danae Hanford, will dive deep into chapter-by-chapter discussions on specifically selected books to help you make better decisions as an entrepreneur. Visit toughdecisions.net to sign up for our free weekly entrepreneur email. Before we get started, let's hear from one of our sponsors. Have you ever thought about investing in real estate, but find yourself so busy that you don't have time for it? Do you have FOMO, which is the fear of missing out? At HanfordCapital.com, we help investors with passive real estate investments that project better returns than traditional investment vehicles such as the stock market. If you'd like to find out more about our passive real estate investments, visit HanfordCapital.com. That's H-A-N-D-F-O-R-D Capital.com. We will jump on a call with you to discuss your investment goals and to see if our investments are a good fit for you. This advertisement is not to be construed as an offer or recommendation to buy or sell a security. Visit HanfordCapital.com. Hello and welcome to the Sunday edition of the Tough Decisions podcast. This is your host, Danae, and we have spent the last several Sundays discussing some of the major concepts from a book called How Children Succeed by Paul Tuff. And I hope you've learned some things about how children succeed and and what we need to do to help the next generation of students, employees, and managers, and leaders, because that's really what they are. Our children are the future employees, employers, and managers, and so on. But I hope you've also learned some things about the way we can think and the way that we can adjust our thinking about certain issues and even to the point of what we value in our children and what we really are stressing and helping them with. Because, you know, we can give lip service to important things that are important to us, but if that's all we ever give is lip service, it's not going to take our, our kids long to figure out that that's not really what we value. So not just telling them what's important, but teaching them and really placing value on these non-cognitive skills. And how do we do that? Well, I think the biggest thing that we do, or the biggest way that we do that is through our example and through our modeling and being you know, very honest and transparent with them, even if it means you know, self-reflection and, and maybe even pointing out some of our own struggles because kids are not dumb. uh, So they see those things anyway. And I think being able to reflect and be honest with them is something that's really important. I want to finish our discussion today and kind of wrap things up. And I hope to share a little bit of Paul Tuff's ideas as far as solutions and things that can help this next generation. Just to kind of spoil it a little bit, he doesn't offer anything really specific as far as, you know, his own specific plan. But what he does talk about is the scope of the changes that he believes would be successful in improving and helping this next generation with these non-cognitive skills. But before we do that, I think it's important that we realize that, you know, we've been talking a lot about low-income students. We've been talking about a lot about poverty and the role that this plays in the lack of of non-cognitive skills. But I do think it's important that we realize that poverty is not the cause of these problems. And sometimes when we have these discussions, we can get caught up in, you know, well, if it weren't for poverty, you know, if it weren't that people had to live in a poor state, then we wouldn't have any of these problems. And in reality, that's a very simplistic view of things. And I think it is actually a very harmful way of looking at things. And as we talk here, I hope to illustrate that. I do think that this discussion can be sort of like the proverbial, which came first, the chicken or the egg, because, you know, a lot of times, not always, and again, that's 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 an important thing too, because when we're having discussions like these, we tend to make generalizations, and there there are always exceptions, and there's always really important exceptions. But in general, many times poverty is more a symptom of the problem than the cause of the problem. You know, a lot of the things that tend to lead to poverty are poor choices and a lack of discipline initially. So is poverty the problem or is poverty a result? In addition, just because one is born into what we might classify as an economically impoverished condition does not mean that he or she was going to experience all the trauma and the stress that typically characterizes poverty. 
And I'm a big history buff, but you don't even have to be, you know, a genius in the realm of history to point to extremely important leaders and innovators in our own U.S. history that were born into poverty, but they didn't stay there. And it didn't mean that, it, you know, it wasn't a sentence to them to live a, a meaningless, unfulfilled life. So just because you're born into, you know, an economically impoverished state doesn't mean that you can't achieve. And, that, and that's, I don't even think that that's necessarily a bad thing. I think it depends on the home. And I think it depends on the way that those children are nurtured. And so just, you know, briefly to name a few, Abraham Lincoln, George Washington Carver. More recently, he's been in the news lately, Dr. Ben Carson. You may or may not agree with his politics, but you can't deny that he came from an economically impoverished situation. But I've heard from his own mouth him tell the story about how his his mother raised him and his brother, I believe, and required and, and demanded these non-cognitive traits and behaviors from them. And she did not accept anything less than that. And he has come from that to, you know, a well-respected pediatric neurosurgeon. So poverty was not something that held him back. Why? Because of the way he was nurtured and loved and developed by the adult in his life. Which brings me to my next point. In almost all these cases, these men and women were born into loving families where one or two adults invested in their lives and took on the responsibility of teaching and demanding from them these important non-cognitive skills, which allows us then to circle back. Maybe poverty is not the cause. Maybe it is, you know, one determining factor. It is likely one factor. But to identify it as the only cause is costly because we can't truly solve a problem until we've accurately identified all the causes. And if we just simplistically pin it on, well, they were poor, then that doesn't allow us to look at the whole situation, identify all the causes, and it just furthers the problem because we're not really coming up with a solution because we haven't identified all the problems. There's other causes, addictions, gang activity, and probably most prominent, the breakdown of the traditional family unit. And unless we address all of these, we're not going to solve the problem. In addition, this is not just a poor problem. I think also, you know, pinning this as a, as a poverty issue leaves out the fact that, you know, even earlier in this book, we talked about the fact that these non-cognitive skills are many times lacking in students from, that come from homes much higher in the socioeconomic scale. They experience many of the same issues. They just have a different starting point. So many times their lack of non-cognitive skills is not seen much until much later down the road. And, you know, it might not have as dramatic effect, but it's still there. And it, it's still a problem. Now, I wanted to read you a quick excerpt from the book to illustrate this because I do think it's important that we not, we not miss this. Remember the school that we talked about earlier was Riverdale, and it was the school in the, in the upper Bronx, I believe. It was a private school. It's known for, you know, many of its graduates are, are well-known figures. And the author, Paul Tuff, had written an article, and actually several of the parents and teachers from this area had read the article and, and responded. He says, reporting at Riverdale, I often felt that I had stumbled upon a pervasive, if still somewhat inchoate anxiety within the contemporary culture of affluence, not poverty, affluence, a feeling that something had gone wrong within the traditional channels of American meritocratic pursuit. The young people were graduating from our finest institutions of higher learning with excellent credentials and well-honed test-taking skills and not much else that will allow them to make their own way in the world. There are fewer entrepreneurs graduating from our best colleges fewer iconoclasts, fewer artists, fewer everything, in fact, except investment bankers and management consultants. Now, to illustrate exactly what he's talking about, let me share a little bit of the statistics that he put into into the book about the choice professions of the graduates from one of the most prestigious institutions in our country, Princeton University. Over one half of the graduates from Princeton went into the finance industry or management consulting. Now, 
what's wrong with these? Well, there's nothing wrong with being in the finance industry or the management and consulting business, but it is, you must admit, a relatively safe career path. And many analysts fear we're sending our best and brightest out in the world to accomplish nothing, really. And in addition, it's no secret that these jobs are not known for their high levels of fulfillment. In fact, many times they're known for their high levels of stress and, you know, over emphasis on achievement and sometimes, you know, to the detriment of relationships and family. And so I refer back to our book that we talked about, Leaders Eat Last and Simon Sinek and some of the statistics that we shared there. He even quotes here, Paul Tuff quotes from a Harvard graduate named James Kwok. He wrote a blog post and after he graduated from Harvard, like many of his classmates, he went to work as a management consultant. He explained that the reason the path is so well trod is not the money though that doesn't hurt. It's that the firms make the path and the decision so easy to take and so hard to resist. The typical contemporary Harvard undergraduate, Kwok wrote, is driven more by fear of not being a success than by a concrete desire to do anything in particular. So what we're seeing here is still the trend of what's the easy path? What's the well-trodden path? So they don't have to do anything difficult. And again, I'm not trying to poo-poo every decision to go into the finance industry or the management consulting because there's no doubt that there is a need for those. But what we don't want is our young people to just do that because that's the easy thing to do. And because, you know, not because they want to accomplish something specific, but just because that's the easiest way to be a success and make money and make a living. And what Kwok is getting at is that the way that these finance institutions and these management consulting firms sell themselves to these graduates is the ease. In other words, just come work for us for five years and then you can make the real decision. What are we seeing here? They're putting off that decision making because they don't want to make that difficult decision or they're perhaps afraid to make that difficult decision. If you're an undergraduate at Harvard, your struggles with the challenges of character might land you in a less than inspiring investment banking job. And that's what I was getting at a minute ago. You know, these students in high income areas, they have the same issues, but it's just that, you know, for them, the consequences might be that you don't make it quite all the way to that investment firm that you wanted to. Whereas with our students in low income areas, it might be a matter of life and death for them or making a living or not making a living. So the problems are the same. The consequences are different. The problems are there and they need to be addressed. And so back to Tuff and his solutions, what he proposes are full scale, all inclusive reform. He argues that changes needed are not just educational or economic. And to his credit, he says we need to get over our discomfort of talking about others' parenting choices. You know, he talks about the fact that if you are not a parent struggling in a low-income situation or, you know, a single-parent home, then you might be hesitant to criticize. And that's understandable. But he says, you know, we need to get over our discomfort of talking about other people's parenting styles and understand that these are things of great importance and they need to be addressed. And, you know, in some cases, parents need help. In some cases, they need assistance getting out of a difficult situation because of a poor choice or a wrong choice that they've made. And I appreciate the way that he ends his challenge saying that character does matter and there isn't much that can be changed about someone's poverty situation until he or she develops some character. On the other hand, character we need to see and remember is a malleable thing. And it is shaped, but not determined by the environment in which an individual grows. So if changes can be made to create an environment more conducive to the development of character, then that is a good place to start. And so that's kind of his conclusion that, you know, full scale, all inclusive reform, not just educational, not just economic, reform because those things, while they are good, leave out a big part of the picture, which is the families and the homes that these these kids are growing up in and realizing that character does matter. So we can't just go in and change their economic situation because that doesn't solve the character issues. On the other hand, realizing that character is malleable. So we need to focus and, and start to figure out ways to teach and develop the character because you can't 
change their poverty situation without addressing character. Because if you do, then they're going to end up right back in the same way because you might have solved the money problem, but you haven't solved the character problem. And then lastly, understanding that character is malleable. It is shaped, but it's not determined by the environment. So yes, when a student is born or a child is born into a difficult situation, it definitely presents challenges, but it's not determined by the environment. We can help to shape it and change it. And that is a part, at least, of the solution to these non-cognitive skills and their impact on the achievement of students. Next up, we're going to be diving into the Harvard Business Review Manager's Handbook and 17 skills leaders need to stand out. So I'm looking forward to diving into that and talking about some of these skills that leaders need in order to be skilled leaders, good leaders of people and in business. Don't forget that next week, Sunday, November 25th, you're going to get to hear my interview and discussion with Dr. Brian Anderson. I had a great time talking with him, and I know you're going to enjoy listening to him. So that's next week. And then following that, in the first week of December, we'll dive into the manager's handbook, 17 Skills Leaders Need to Stand Out. Thank you for listening to the Tough Decisions Network. Be sure to visit toughdecisions.net to gain access to show notes for this episode and to join our free weekly entrepreneur email where we will send you news about the latest technology for your business, inspiring quotes, and the latest books for entrepreneurs. That's toughdecisions.net.